from now, we would like to start new session, Interventions and Lifestyle Change Promoting lo Longevity and Healthy Aging. The first speaker is Professor Frank Fu from Harvard Medical School, Diet Strategies for Promoting of Longevity and Healthy Aging. Professor Fu, please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure and a privilege for me to speak at this uh, very exciting uh, symposium. So, um, something can, doesn't, doesn't advance. For some reason, the. Um, Okay, will take some time for me. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Um, as you all know, uh, several dietary strategies have been um, uh, suggested to um, uh, for the prevention of dis uh, chronic diseases and, and longevity. So those include uh, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, protein restriction, ketogenic diet, and, and so on and so forth. So some of those diets have been studied very extensively in animal experiments, like caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, or protein restriction, or, or even ketogenic diets. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this uh, uh, data from animal experiments or small human uh, trials. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on uh, data from large uh, epidemiological studies because, as you know, it's impossible to uh, conduct large randomized clinical trials uh, to test the effects of those uh, diet strategies on longevity or chronic diseases because you would need hundreds of thousands of people and uh, the intervention would last, I mean, uh, decades. Uh, so that's not feasible in, in the real world. Uh, instead, uh, we can use uh, large epidemiological studies to uh, look at the real-world impact of uh, uh, various dietary uh, strategies or dietary patterns on chronic diseases and, and longevity. So most of the data I'm going to present uh, today come from our uh, large cohort studies, uh, especially the nurses' health study. Uh, the initial nurses' health study was established in 1976, and uh, those participants have been followed for several decades now. The second nurses' health study uh, was established in 1986, and the third generation of nurse health study was established in uh, 19, uh, uh, 2010. So overall, we have more than 300,000 women who have been followed for, for several decades. We also have a parallel cohort of men called Health Professional Follow-Up Studies. And in those large cohorts, we have collected uh, detailed data on diet and lifestyle every two to four years. So we have repeated measures of uh, diet and lifestyle uh, on a regular basis in the last several decades. We have also collected a massive number of uh, biospecimen samples, uh, including blood, urine, and stool samples. So uh, the original nurses' health study, as I mentioned earlier, was established in 1976. Uh, uh, at baseline, the average age of the cohort uh, was about 40 years old. And now, several decades later, the average age of the nurses' health study participants uh, was, is about 88 years old. In fact, many of the participants are already centenarians. So the nurses' health study, I think, has become a perfect cohort for studying uh, the effects of diet, lifestyle, biomarkers, um, uh, healthy aging, and longevity. Uh, this is a study we uh, published a few years ago looking at um, the impact of uh, several healthy lifestyle factors on life expectancies. So we look at physical activity at least half hour per day, uh, eating a relatively healthy diet, uh, normal body weight, and light to moderate alcohol consumption. So we look at those five lifestyle factors. Those are not very extreme lifestyle factors. In fact, they are moderate lifestyle factors. So this figure shows estimates life expectancy at age 50 according to the number of low risk factor, low risk lifestyle factors. So as you can see here, as the number of low risk factor uh, increase, the life expectancy at age 50 increase in the dose response manner for both women and men. 
for women who uh, didn't follow any of those low risk factors, their life expectancy at age 50 was 29 years old. However, for those who follow all the five lifestyle factors, the, uh, their life expect expectancy at the age 50 uh, was 43. So there is a 14 year difference between those two groups uh, in women. For men, uh, the difference between the two groups in terms of life expectancy uh, is 12 years. So it means that uh, following those five lifestyle factors can add at least 10 years of extra life uh, uh, to the life expectancy for people who are um, uh, age 50. When we look at individual risk factors, as you can see that uh, the more cigarette uh, a person smokes, uh, the lower the life expectancy. For body weight, the, lowest, low, the highest life expectancy was found among those who are normal weight. For people who are underweight or, or obese, they'll uh, have lower life expectancy compared to those who are normal weight. For alcohol, those who uh, drink light to moderate amount of alcohol had the highest life expectancy. Uh, those who drink heavily had reduced life expectancy. Uh, for diet, uh, the more, the higher the quality of the diet, the higher the life expectancy. Exercise, the more excess you do, the higher the life expectancy. So we calculated that stop smoking can add five years of life um, if you're already uh, age 50. For healthy weight, add uh, actual four years, regular exercise three years, and healthy diet uh, three years. Uh, light to moderate alcohol, two years. Uh, here, I think the uh, benefit of a healthy diet is, is likely to be underestimated because we know that a healthy diet also contributes to a uh, healthy body weight. So uh, this study uh, look at the trajectories of a body shape uh, in relation to mortality. So uh, we have collected very detailed data on some monotypes or body shapes from age five all the way to age 50. So based on the somonotype or body shape data, we classified individuals into five different groups, lifelong lean group, lean moderate increase group, lean market increase group, medium stable group, and a heavy stable increase group. So we found that in terms of mortality risk, the lifelong lean group, so this is the group, uh, very low uh, BMI uh, as child, and this remain uh, at very low BMI as a uh, young adult or middle, uh, uh, or during middle adulthood uh, around BMI, BMI is uh, around 23 or 24. So this group has the lowest mortality risk. And not surprisingly, uh, the heavy stable or heavy increase group had the highest mortality risk. Those people who started in lean and then had a substantial increase in uh, uh, BMI in young adulthood, middle adulthood, they also had increased mortality risk. So this study provides indirect evidence that mild lifelong caloric restriction uh, may contribute to longevity. Uh, in terms of dietary fats, we found uh, different types of fats have different uh, 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 effects on mortality. So trans fat is the worst type of fat, which is not surprising. Saturated fat from animal products uh, is also associated with increased risk of mortality. On the other hand, unsaturated fat, especially polyunsaturated fat from nuts, seeds, vegetable oils, and fish, uh, is strongly associated with uh, lower mortality risk. For protein, uh, we found that animal protein and uh, plant protein have uh, a divergent effects on mortality. So increasing animal protein intake is associated with increased uh, uh, total and CVD mortality. On the other hand, uh, higher intake plant protein is associated with lower mortality risk. Uh, there has been a lot of interest on um, the effects of uh, low carbohydrate diet uh, on weight loss and, and uh, longevity. So in this study, we found that uh, uh, a low carbohydrate diet that is high in animal fat, animal protein, is actually associated with increased mortality risk. On the other hand, uh, a relatively low carbohydrate diet with high amount of vegetable protein and the vegetable fat is actually associated with uh, lower mortality risk. So in terms of uh, uh, different uh, foods and beverages, uh, the most one of the most consistent findings from our cohorts and also from other studies is the uh, inverse association between coffee consumption and uh, mortality. So in our three large cohort studies, we found uh, regular consumption of coffee is associated with uh, total mortality uh, and cardiovascular mortality. 
And another consistent finding is that uh, regular consumption of nuts, including both tree nuts and, um, uh, and uh, peanuts, is associated with lower mortality risk. And it's not surprising, a higher consumption of fruits and vegetables is also associated with lower mortality risk. Uh, but what's interesting is that we found a different type of fruits and vegetables uh, have different effects. So for example, uh, green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, citrus fruits, and also uh, berries have the strongest uh, inverse association uh, with mortality. Even though olive oil consumption is quite low in the US population compared to European populations, we found a robust inverse association between higher consumption of olive oil and the lower risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have consistently found that whole grain, higher consumption of whole grains is associated with lower mortality risk. So all those foods are plant-based foods, minimally processed foods, and they are high in uh, fiber uh, or polyphenols, and, and also uh, some of the foods have high amount of uh, unsaturated fats and uh, um, plant protein. So th I think this result suggests that higher consumption of minimally processed uh, plant foods are beneficial for longevity. Uh, recently, we published a paper looking at four different eating patterns in relation to uh, total and, of course, specific mortality. So we uh, look at four um, different dietary patterns, uh, HEI 2015, uh, it's based on the dietary guidelines for Americans. The Mediterranean diet, a uh, healthy plant-based diet, uh, is very similar to the traditional Asian diet or the Okinawa diet. And then HEI uh, is based on the Harvard uh, eating uh, plate. Uh, we found that uh, adherence uh, to any of those four dietary patterns is associated with lower mortality risk. And uh, those healthy eating patterns not only reduce CVD and cancer mortality, but also mortality due to neurological and respiratory diseases. And uh, pra in practice, those patterns can be tailored to individual food and cultural preferences, preferences and the health conditions. Uh, we have recently com completed uh, uh, metabolome-wide association analysis of mortality and longevity in our cohort. So uh, uh, in this uh, analysis, we included more than 240 uh, metabolites. Uh, uh, we measured in plasma using LCMS, and we identified several uh, metabolites that are positively associated with uh, all-cause mortality, which include uh, nucleosides, uh, gamma amino acid, uh, ceramides, isocalatines, and the nipids with uh, uh, lower number of uh, double bonds. On the other hand, uh, several metabolites are associated with uh, lower mortality risk, which include uh, highly unsaturated nipids and the L uh, serine. And we conducted external replications of uh, those results using the PREDIMED trial. As uh, many of you know, the PREDIMED trial is the largest uh, dietary inter intervention study of uh, primary prevention of CVD using Mediterranean diet intervention. And in this trial, uh, more than 7,000 participants were randomized to three groups, a controlled diet and a Mediterranean diet with uh, mixed nuts, Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin olive oil. After five years intervention, uh, the intervention uh, diets significantly reduced CVD incidence by 30% compared to the control diet. In the last 10 years, we have been collaborating with uh, uh, PREDIMED investigators to, con to conduct uh, large-scale metabolomics profiling of the, those participants. And uh, uh, in this replication analysis, we found that um, the metabolites we identified uh, in our cohorts uh, uh, were replicated uh, in the PREDIMED trial. So again, uh, some of those metabolites uh, especially ceramides and the collagen's uh, metabolites have been found to predict increased risk of type 2 diabetes and the CVD in our cohorts and also uh, in the PREDIMED trial. And using uh, the metabolomics data, we, create, we created a multi-metabolite score uh, that significantly predicted increased mortality and the decreased longevity in the U.S. and the Spanish cohorts. And our previous analysis uh, showed that uh, the Mediterranean diet interventions supplemented with nuts or extra virgin olive oils uh, significantly reduced the harmful effects of ceramides and the on CVD risk. 
Uh, using the metabolomics data, we uh, uh, developed a metabolic signature for adherence to the Mediterranean diet in the PREDIMED trial and then validated the signature in the um, uh, US cohorts. And then uh, we found that uh, this metabolic signature significantly predicted lower risk of CVD in both uh, the US population and the Spanish uh, population. And then we conducted Mendelian randomization analysis uh, using the genetic uh, variants uh, that predict the metabolic signature. We found that genetically inferred metabolic signature is also associated with lower risk of CHD and the stroke. Uh, we know that uh, healthy dietary patterns like uh, Mediterranean diet can improve gut microbiome. Uh, in this analysis, uh, we look at the uh, interactions or interplays between gut microbiome and uh, adherence to Mediterranean diet in relation to cardiometabolic disease risk. Uh, what we found is that, uh, uh, as expected, the Mediterranean dietary pattern is associated with uh, healthy um, gut microbiome composition. And um, uh, I think more interestingly, we found that gut microbiome composition modulates uh, the protective association between uh, Mediterranean dietary pattern and the cardi cardiometabolic disease risk. Specifically, we found that uh, uh, individuals who have lower uh, abundance of this bacteria uh, species, uh, Provotola, um, uh, they are more likely to benefit from uh, Mediterranean dietary interventions compared to those who have higher abundance of this uh, uh, bacteria species. So this study suggests that uh, um, uh, the microbiome composition uh, may contribute to individual uh, differences in response to uh, Mediterranean dietary interventions. We also found that uh, adherence to Mediterranean diet uh, is associated with uh, increased uh, telomere length uh, in the nurse's health study uh, cohort. Other studies have found that adherence to uh, Mediterranean dietary pattern or other uh, healthy eating patterns uh, is associated with uh, uh, um, reduced uh, epigenetic uh, uh, clock. So uh, those studies suggest that uh, um, adherence to healthy eating patterns can improve biological uh, bi uh, biomarkers of aging. Uh, some of you may um, be familiar with the MIND diet. MIND diet is a combination of the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet. It's basically the American, American version of the Mediterranean diet or Americanized uh, Mediterranean diet. So this uh, diet encouraged consumption of 10 healthy food groups and it discouraged consumption of five unhealthy uh, uh, food groups. And studies have shown that uh, adherence to uh, the MIND diet significantly uh, slows down the cognitive decline with age and also uh, is associated with reduced risk of dementia. We know that there are many uh, beneficial aspects of the traditional Asian diets or the uh, uh, Okinawa diet. And um, uh, for example, those dietary traditional diets typically contain high amount of uh, green leafy vegetables, beans, lentils, soy foods, nuts, seeds, healthy cooking oils, phytochemical, uh, rich herbs and s spices, healthy beverages such as green tea or red tea, fermented vegetables rich in uh, probiotics, and some Asian populations have high consumption of fish and seafood. So some of those positive uh, elements of the traditional a Asian diet can be combined with the Mediterranean diet to improve um, health outcomes. Sorry. So to test this idea, um, uh, Dr. Aris Shai in Israel, a long-term collaborator uh, with us, uh, conducted this uh, randomized clinical trial called Directed Trial. This was published in AGCN last year. So in this trial, 300 uh, participants were, were randomized to three groups, a uh, control diet and um, a Mediterranean diet with uh, supplemented with 28 gram uh, per day of uh, walnuts, and then um, a Mediterranean diet supplemented with uh, walnuts, three to four cups of uh, green tea, and also uh, mankai shake. Mankai is a tiny uh, uh, green duckweed, duck which is very high in polyphenols, 
So the amount of polyphenols in the um, in, in the third group is several times higher than that in the second group or uh, the control diet. And after one and a half years of intervention, the Mediterranean diet uh, supplemented with walnuts, green tea, and the mankai shake significantly attenuated age-related brain atrophy measured by uh, hippocampal uh, volume shrinkages using the MRI. And also this dietary intervention significantly improved gut microbiome, significantly reduced visceral, uh, visceral fat, and, and also uh, improved insulin sensitivity. So this trial suggested that combining positive elements from different dietary traditions, such as the traditional Asian diet, uh, the traditional Mediterranean diet, can significantly improve uh, health outcomes and, and, and also improve uh, brain uh, uh, structure or brain functions. So to uh, summarize, those are some of the take home messages uh, from my uh, presentation. First of all, uh, maintaining a healthy body weight across life stages is important for longevity and healthy aging. So the data I presented earlier, I think mimic the effects of my long-term caloric restriction. And certainly there is no one size fits all diet uh, for longevity. Some of the traditional diets such as the Mediterranean diet, Nordic diet, and the Asian diet have been shown to uh, um, improve longevity and reduce mortality. And also um, the DASH diet or the AGI and some combination of those diets like the MIND diet have also been shown to be beneficial. So this means that there are many different ways to adopt a healthy, a healthy dietary pattern according to your own food and cultural preferences and, and the health conditions. And certainly there is no magic food for longevity, but a healthy diet typically include high amount of polyphenol rich foods that have beneficially influenced gut microbiome and the small molecule metabolites. And we and others have shown that those healthy eating patterns are associated with longer telomere length and uh, uh, decreased epigenetic aging, uh, which are important uh, biomarkers of uh, aging. And finally, a healthy diet combined with lung smoking regular exercise, not being overweight, and moderate alcohol extends at least 10 years of life free of major chronic diseases. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hu. Is there anybody who would like? So we'd like to, yeah, Joristin to ask the question. Yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. I was wondering, are you also looking at gene environment interaction or gene diet interaction in your studies, given you have such a massive cohort? And I was wondering, mm -hmm. are there specific diets where a specific genetic background would work better, or don't you really mm -hmm. see this kind of patterns in your data? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we have conducted uh, numerous analysis on gene diet interactions. The most consistent findings uh, that we have observed is for uh, obesity because um, uh, obesity uh, is very um, uh, relatively easy to study. Uh, it's a continuous outcome, so we have enormous statistical power. What we have found is that people who carry more uh, obesity genes are more susceptible to adverse effects of sugary beverages, uh, physical inactivity, fast food, and so on and so forth. So it means that uh, uh, some people are more susceptible to uh, uh, harmful effects of food, uh, I think have something to do with the genetic predisposition. Uh, but this doesn't mean that uh, uh, those people have to give up on their <laughs> behavior changes because eventually, uh, even for those who carry a lot of obesity genes, uh, diet and lifestyle modifications can still make a big difference in their um, um, health outcomes. And, and do you then also see, for example, that people that are from Asia were, have a better profile for an Okinawan diet than individuals that are from the U.S. or from, say, from Europe that are better fit for the Mediterranean diet? Or doesn't that seem to matter? Can you just implement any diet on any genetic background as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think this is certainly related to more personalized nutrition uh, 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 arena. Uh, at, at this point, I don't think we have uh, good data to show that the uh, Asians are more uh, uh, benefit more from Okinawa diet, or, uh, or uh, uh, people from the West are more uh, benefit more from the Mediterranean diet, or vice versa. We, d we don't have this kind of data yet. Thank you. So we'd like to move on to the second question. Uh, 
Let me, uh, very nice uh, presentation, thank you very much. And uh, the, I think uh, that that's important to analyze the uh, you know, materials on the bit, uh, diet, maybe. I think uh, the you know, cooking way is a very much uh, important mm -hmm. factor. On the cooking way and uh, eating habit, mm -hmm. maybe the you know, be, be more important than the an analysis of the materials. How do you think of it? Yeah, that's a terrific question. In, in fact, we have um, uh, collected data on cooking methods mm. in our uh, 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 food frequency mm. questionnaire. So we ask mm. them how they typically cook their meats mm. uh, or, or, um, uh, or fish. Mm. Uh, and we found that high yeah. temperature cooking, mm. uh, which is very common mm. in the US, like mm. grilling, barbecuing, is associated with increased risk uh -huh. of diabetes and uh, other health outcomes, independent of what mm. they eat. So you're right. I think yeah, yeah. The, the way uh, the food is cooked mm. uh, is uh, also important. Mm -hmm. You have uh, usually analyzed the materials of the meat or fish or something. Mm. The after fishing, how, how different was the eating food or <laughs> materials? Right. I mean, uh, high temperature cooking can generate a lot of harmful uh, substances, um, and uh, s some of the substances have been shown to promote carcinogenesis and increase oxidative stress and inflammation. Mm. So that's why I think high temperature cooking, which mm. is often uh, very common in the US, may uh, have additional harmful effects beyond uh, the food, uh, the type of food they consume. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And if, uh, Professor Hu, if you don't mind, one more question. Uh, this is for my personal research interest, and thank you for excellent uh, presentation, of course, excellent results. And my main research is in the field of sleep, and uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned a number of lifestyle factors. When adhered to, right. you can increase uh, or add some additional years of life, and now sleep has been considered as one of those uh, lifestyle factors. So the way sleep works, we don't really know how that impacts uh, health. Uh, and one idea is that people who sleep very short, where mm -hmm. we can see the increased mortality, um, that they have to compensate that short sleep by having a very high energy diet to get that energy going. And could have you in any way looked at diet as a mediating factor for? Yeah, we, we have actually collected a lot of data on sleep duration and snoring and, and other uh, sleep-related uh, questions. Uh, what we found is this J-shape or U-shape relationship, so too much sleep or too little sleep is not good for any of the health outcomes. When we add sleep to the five risk factors, it improved the uh, prediction of uh, chronic disease and mortality, even though the improvement is, is modest. Uh, at this point, um, we, we don't have a comprehensive analysis of adding SNEEP to the five factors on life expectancy, but we have the data on chronic disease risk and the mortality. Thank you very much. And I thank you again for your excellent presentation. Okay, thank you. So we would like to move on to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Erki Vartiainen from the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare from Helsinki. Um, who will talk about changing from a red zone towards a blue zone, the North Karelia project. Uh, Professor, please. Th thank you. So let's go to Finland for next 20 minutes. This is the map of Finland, and uh, then and um, and here is um, North Karelia, which is the most eastern province in Finland. It used to be a very poor area, agriculture and forest, forest industry. There was about little less than 200,000 people living in the beginning of the, of the program. And here was our problem. This is the mortality statistics for coronary heart disease in 1973. And you can see that Finland was the highest, highest in the world at that time and Japan was the lowest. So in Finland, the mortality was like 350, and in Japan, it was like 60. So quite a big, big uh, difference. And there was also a difference inside Finland, so that in North Karelia, the, the mortality was about 700 per, per 100,000. 
the start of the program. Background was also in the seven country studies started in North Carolina since 1955. So it was uh, recognized that mortality is very high and also the risk factors are very high. Blood cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking are, are very high. And um, also people recognize that, <coughs> that young men at the age of 40 or 50 are dying for coronary heart disease. So based this, this statistical information and people own observa observation, the local political and other leaders went to Helsinki to talk to the, the, the uh, government if government help can help in one way or other this, with this problem. At that time, there was not very much expertise in Finland about the cardiovascular disease prevention, so, so government invited WO experts and also our experts from the United States to, to design the program. And the main recommendation was that, that a reduction in blood cholesterol, blood pressure and smoking may be the key points. At that time, it was not at all clear that if there are causal factors, and there was a lot of discussion in the beginning of the program that it, do we have enough evidence to, to change the diet in all the, all the population. But in any case, it was started. So two main questions, can the risk factors and behaviors be changed on the population level? And if the risk factor will reduce, what will happen to the mortality? At that time, it was not known. The main objective was to reduce cardiovascular mortality and later also uh, like diabetes and cancer have been included in the, in the agenda. Uh, and the intermediate objective was to reduce the population level or main risk factors, emphasizing lifestyle changes and to promote secondary prevention. And there was a national objective. The idea was that let's look at what happened, what can be done in one province, and if it's feasible and effective, then we can expand that also the, or the, or, or also the other, other areas. The high-risk strategy or population strategy. So <coughs> if we are selecting only the high-risk strategy, we can affect relatively small proportion of coronary mortalities because most of the cases are coming from the risk, risk, risk factor distribution, which are, uh, uh, are on the median level of the risk factors. So the main message from this was that the only way to really re reduce mortality in that area was to reduce the risk factor distribution to the left, not only those who are very high in the risk. Individual choice or government's duty. And uh, that's also related to the politics. So um, if you are more like a conservative, the individual level, it's not government business, it's the individual people who have, have to do the choice. And if, if you are more like a Democrats or social Democrats, then it's also the government, government business. And we have been using that in the way that if the conservatives are in the in the, in the <coughs> power, we are developing more programs for the individual level. And if when the de Democrats are in, in, in power, then we are developing the tobacco legislation, alcohol policy and nutrition policy and, and so on. In any case, you need both. The <coughs> there was a medical framework and social behavioral framework. <coughs> the basic idea was the primary prevention main target, smoking, diet, cholesterol, blood pressure, population approach, general risk factor reduction, emphasizing lifestyle changes. And there are some of the social behavioral framework, social marketing, behavioral modification, communication, innovation, diffusion theory, community or organization, which were more or less used during the planning. Here is one of the model we have been using <coughs> In the first step is that you must have the knowledge 
but we all know that knowledge is not changing the behavior. We need the persuasion or motivation, we need practical skills, we need social support, environmental support, and community organization, which is related to rules and regulations and norms and values and so, so on. When you are planning an intervention, I think that you should think about which of these components you are hitting. In one program, you cannot hit all, all at the same time. The practical intervention emphasizes on persuasion, practical skills, social and environmental su support for the change. There was a research team in, and, uh, uh, in the university and then the local pro pro project office, and there was a comprehensive community in involvement. The basic idea was that there is a relatively small program office which was not running the program. The program was running in different settings, at schools, work sites, media, health services, NGOs, who, was, who was, did the practical, practical work. The only idea was that the program office was like helping or guiding in, in these different programs. There was a lot of media activities, preventive services, primary health care, training for professionals, environmental changes, and also monitoring and, and, and feedback. So what's happened? <clears throat> we are running the health examination surveys in, in Finland every five years. And the sample size is about 1,000, about and the participation is about 60 to 70 70%. 70 in the beginning, it was done for the evaluation of the North Karelia project, but then we recognized that we need this information also in other parts of the Finland. And since, since 92, we have been calling this <coughs> uh, Fin risk study. Um, and um, when we, the total number of people who are participating in this uh, surveys <coughs> is about, about 100,000. Then we are linking the registers, mortality statistic, hospital discharge, uh, drug reimbursement uh, registers. So it's very rich database. And um, we have also the stool samples. We have a lot of international cooperation. I'm very pleased that the San Diego colleagues are now analyzing our our stool samples, and it will be very interesting to see what will be the results. You can see that um, the red is North Karelia. <coughs> During the first five years, serum cholesterol reduce uh, more in North Karelia than in, 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 in so-called reference area, Kuopio province. And after that, the development has been about the same all over the, over the Finland. And that was actually the original idea. Uh, you can see that the very similar development in f among women, female. You can see that there has been increase in 2007 and 2012 in cholesterol level, and that's related to this low-carb discussion in Finland. Some of the prominent medical doctors were recommending that using the saturated fats mainly as a substitute. And there was a lot of discussion that in, in Finland you can see that cholesterol increased, but then it's going da down again. And I think that we, have, we had the same <coughs> movement also in, in, in US and, and uh, also in, in Sweden where there was similar increase in serum cholesterol levels. So, so the main message is that if there is a positive development in the risk factors, it not guaranteed that will continue without any activities. Use of butter for cooking from 70% to, to about 10%. The main fat used in Finland in the 1970s was mainly milk fat. Milk fat. And it was what was regarded as a healthy food in 1970s. So it was butter, full milk, 
cream, eggs, lard, and no vegetables. Vegetables were for rabbits. <laughs> and <coughs> and uh, th this, is, this, is, this, this was the value. And these the products the people were, were producing. So it was very difficult in the beginning to explain that <coughs> you should change to the margarine and vegetable oils, oils and eat this rapid food and, and, and so on. But also the situation was so bad that gradually peop people start to believe that they have to do, do something. And there was a change, uh, as you can see, very big changes. And here's use of vegetable oil for cooking. In 1970s, there was no <coughs> vegetable oil available in Finland. And there was the rapeseed oil developed in, <coughs> in 1980s. And you can see that that's the most common at the moment. Spread used on, uh, on, on bread. Butter has been declined and it has been replaced by margarine or put or put oil, oil mixture. And very similar development among, among women. You, if you are thinking that th these are very big changes in the population level, it means that also the agriculture policy must change. Also the food industry must change. All the marketing can, can, must be changed. So it has been a really deep change in the society and not only that individual behavior has been, has been changed. And sometimes it has been not easy and it has been sometimes also very, very painful. This is then 24 hours recall. The saturated fat reduced from about 20%. It was lowest at 2007 at about 12. And there has been a slight increase after, after that. When the recommendation is less than 10, so there is still way to go. And there's a very similar picture in female. Couple of side stories. This is the serum cholesterol in Japan and Finland 1970s. And you can see that the highest values in Japan are the lowest values in North Korea. Then there was a discussion that if this high risk high cholesterol level is like genetic background on the population level. Well, together with our colleagues in Italy, we did a study where we changed the North Karelian diet, basically to the Mediterranean diet for six weeks and then back to North Karelian diet. And you can see that <coughs> HDL cholesterol really reduced and then increased back. And there was a mirror study done in, in Italy, when the Italian diet, diet was changed to the North Karelian diet. And so the HDL cholesterol increased in six weeks, and then it was changed back to the Italian diet, diet and the cholesterol, LDL cholesterol reduced back. So this indicates that at least population level, there is no evidence that, uh, that genetic markers, at, in these, in, at least in these two population, may any, play any major role. Systolic blood pressure decline, also for women. And one of the main reasons for that was that the, <coughs> the salt intake has been re reduced from about 12, pros, 12 grams to, to about 9 grams. And this has been very much done together with the, with the food industry. Smoking reduced. Smoking increase among women in the beginning and then start to decline. And when there's another data set, behavioral risk factor monitoring, smoking has been declined about 60% to about 16% about, um, among men and 15% and among female with very active tobacco policy in different level. Only the problem is the body mass index is going up. Diabetes is going up, and this is like a global pandemic, and I think nobody has a real answer to, to this problem at the moment. Here are the examples of when there was no, no vegetable oil in, in Finland, so the rapeseed oil was developed in Finland, and, and very important example for the 
uh, uh, cooperation with the food industry, the biscuit uh, manufacturer re replaced sub saturated fats by other fats, removed the trans fats, and other meat pro products. Uh, one company was using less than 60,000 kilograms less salt and uh, 100,000 kilograms less saturated fats. So the cooperation with the food industry has been quite important. Then we have the heart symbol to help people to select the, the healthy food. And this was the mortality change from about 700 to about, about, about 100. So there has been an 84% decline in the mortality. And the risk factors are explaining most of the, most of the <coughs> decline. The, Black line is the real risk factor reduction, and the red line is how much the risk factors are explaining. And in the 70s, all the decline was explained by the risk factors, but after there is a gap, how much the risk factors can explain, and the new treatment are explaining quite nicely that's that difference. Why diet change in Finland? North Karelia project like initiated the idea. The Gradually, the concept of health, uh, healthy diet changed. There was possible to get the consensus in the medical, poly, medical community. And after that, it was possible to get the political consensus. And there was a government health policy statement in 85. And after that, the legislation, rules and regulations were, were, were able to to chase, and that the food industry and agriculture got interested and, and cooperate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Vartena, for this excellent talk and uh, for sharing this fantastic su success story with us. Um, I can see there is a question from Professor Melanda and yes. Professor Suzuki after. Please stop. I'm, I'm uh, interested in uh, um, um, paper, and uh, maybe I looked at your paper, and uh, you told me the com consumption, average com consumption of the tofu in the Finland people are the lowest. That's correct or not? And uh, uh, that's a uh, Finland people happen to have a tofu not so frequently. That's the lowest consumption of the tofu is the lowest in the world. Also, the in, in, in Japan, uh, it's in Okinawa, uh, ok tofu consumption is the highest in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's correct or not? Yeah, the tofu consumption is increasing in Finland. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. But it's mm. uh, still very low level. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody it's becoming more and more popular. So also in the restaurants now, there is a, the, 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 it's in the menu. Ah. And it's a relatively new phenomenon, like uh, five, five, five years or le ah, less than, yeah. at least less than 10 years. No. Mm. Uh, increase now. Yeah. No, thank you very much. <laughs> That's interesting. I, thank you, Eric. I, I have uh, an additional question. I think there is more uh, coming. Um, so, uh, it's obvious that the intervention was dependent on several different uh, pillars, but the, the government in Helsinki played a, a role that the people believed that what they were suggesting was right, and also the interaction with the food industry. I, I'm just thinking if, if the Rome government, uh, whatever color, the South Italian would do the opposite. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but what I'm coming, uh, so this, this, um, this uh, belief in what government and university said, you should change your diet and uh, the heart symbol was a success and so on. My question is, do you think this is still the case if, we, if you would redo it today? I'm thinking about today, there is the social media where 18-year-old influencers can tell uh, 5 million Finns uh, that eating this and this and that is the best thing. And so have we lost the opportunity in today's uh, media society to do something similar again? 
yes, but we have also the, the possibility here to, 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 to do that. So it's in the, the debate in the, uh, in the beginning was between, mainly between the dairy industry and scientists, and uh, also inside the scientists. And once the scientists get, had, had a consensus, then the political leaders start to believe it because they also see the problem. So the, the, the mortality was, was there. So I think that the, what the government was able to do, put some funding in the programs, but also to change the legislation. Like in the, <coughs> in the beginning, the price of margarine was the same because there was extra price for the extra tax for the margarine and subsidies to the party. And to change that was in the law. So to change that was a big, really big, big thing because reduce one kilogram of, of rapeseed oil may cost like two euros and to produce one kilogram butter may, may cost like 10 euros because it's the next level in the, in the food, food chains. So this type of things were <coughs> what government were able to do. Uh, there's one more question. Professor. Yes, thank you very much for your contribution. And this is a very good example of contribution between scientists, policy makers, to convince the food industry and the agriculture to change something and to bring incentive to, so that it will be positive. It's really a, exciting. And I would like to know if you were able to export this. I am thinking about Estonia, because Estonia is really close to Finland, and, uh, and I have some experience with Estonian uh, diet, and it's really far, uh, smoking, drinking, uh, fat, and so on. So did you have a possibility to export your recipe to Estonia, all Baltics, and maybe Sweden also? Yeah. We have had co quite a lot of cooperation with the Baltic countries during the during the years. We have we were running an international visitors week twice a, twice a year, about thirty years, and uh, uh, we were like explain, explaining this concept, and then people were visiting in 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 North Karelia, and based on that program, many many other programs were started throughout the world. So I think that was the one way to export that to, to other countries. It, was no, it is not so that, that you can take the North Karelia project, implement that in South Asia, but, but, <coughs> but the concept, you can learn the concept and basic, basic ideas and get the feeling that something can be done. And you did not talk about the alcohol, alcohol consumption. Did you succeed to decrease the alcohol consumption? That was not part of the program, but in, in general we have an alcohol policy in Finland. That's another story. But the positi positive thing is that um, since 2007, the alcohol consumption has been declining in Finland. Yeah. And so especially among young, young people. Yeah. So because the tax, the tax on alcohol are so high. Th that's very high. So <laughs> that's, that's the reason Finns are coming to Estonia to buy the alcohol. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to welcome to the stage Professor David Brenner, um, uh, University of California in San Diego, San Diego. And um, David, will talk about a healthy liver, key to longevity and healthy aging, question mark. Th Please, thank David. You. Thank you. Um, that was not my title. I I'm very suspicious that, that Ali and Salvador made up that title, because I, 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 this is not my air of expertise, but I took it seriously, and I'll tell you what I learned. Okay, so to figure this out, I first looked at what are the functions of the liver, and how can they be related to aging? And you know, when you look at this, the functions of the liver affect all the organs. Um, it's the major metabolic organ. It, it, it is involved in virtually secretion of every major protein in the blood. It is involved in detoxification. It's involved in um, glucose metabolism, micronutrients, and of course, um, cholesterol. And it's one of the largest immune organs in the body. So there are all these opportunities. 
So when I, I, I got to the question mark, is a healthy liver key to healthy aging in favor? Uh, many functions of the liver will affect the health of multiple organs in the body, so that's in favor. But again, you know, unlike heart disease, dementia, and cancer, the liver does not really fail with age. Those of us who are clinicians don't see people coming in with liver you know, um, dysfunction, you know, um, decompensation, unless they have an underlying liver disease. It's not one of the organs that goes bad over age. Um, and the reason probably is the liver has excessive capacity. It, it has enormous capacity. So even if you lose some of it, it's probably not clinically relevant. Okay, so I was kind of stuck. But what, what I think there actually is something here. And what I'm going to propose is that there's a relation between aging, liver injury, and the metabolic syndrome and NASH. NASH is um, short for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay. So what is NASH? NASH is by far the most common liver disease in the United States. It has the following characteristics. It's part of the metabolic syndrome. It consists of um, steatosis, which is fat in the liver. It consists of injury. These are famous ballooning hepatocytes and inflammation shown by these inflammatory cells. And then finally, it's shown by um, the um, cirrhosis, it, with fibrosis, progressing cirrhosis, and even hepatocellular cancer if you go out far enough. So, what's the relationship between NAFL and aging? Well, first of all, NAFL is largely unheard of in younger people. The only exceptions are people who have a um, genetic predisposition, and we see some early patients, but the vast majority of patients with NAFL are older. So, NAFL increases with age, so that's a relationship. The relationship that's even stronger, though, is um, with cancer. Um, Hepatocellular cancer is almost strictly a disease of older um, people. In the United States, in, in, in Africa, with this hepatitis B still endemic, it's not true. But, but in the United States, it's really, really skewed toward, um, toward older people. So there's something going on between liver disease and, um, and age, and, um, and, and with, with, does NAFL fit in with this? And, and I'm going to show you why I think it is. Okay. So. Now I'm going to switch to some mouse studies to get some pathophysiology, and then I'll go back and then with human studies. So, so the, 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 the mouse studies show, we've done some of these, other people have done it, um, that it, older mice do not recover the liver function it, as, as um, younger mice. And one example, one of the best examples is we, we do this all the time in the laboratory, it's a partial epitectomy, and you see how fast the liver regrows, and younger mice um, regrow the liver much more effectively than, than older mice. And this is because the older hepatocytes do not respond to the normal um, um, mitogenic factors like, um, like um, epithelial growth factor and, and, and serum. So these are the younger mice hepatocytes, these are the older mice hepatocytes, dramatic decrease in the ability to, um, um, to regenerate. Many people have said it's because of telomeres. I, I don't think that's right. The telomere length is a little bit shorter in older people. These are back to adults, to, to humans, um, than, than in younger people. But the, the liver doesn't turn over that much. I, the, the telomeres shrink slowly over time. But I don't think it's actually going to compromise liver function. I think there's better explanations. OK. So th these are now studies from our laboratory. So, so what we did is the following. W we took. Um, we call middle-aged mice, <laughs> middle-aged mice on um, a, a low-fat diet, old mice on a low-fat diet, middle-aged mice on a high-fat diet, and old mice on a high-fat diet. And what we found, to our surprise, is that old mice on a regular diet, uh, you know, a regular mouse chow diet, do develop steatosis. So that was a surprise. And of course, as we expected, high-fat um, diet will make the steatosis worse. And there's amazing synergies between here, here, shown here, between the high-fat diet and age. So age alone gives you some steatosis, high-fat diet alone gives you some steatosis, but the combined gives you more dramatic steatosis. Okay. Then we looked at the next stage. Remember I told you steatosis is the first stage of NAFL, the next stage is inflammation? Same thing. As we expected, the high-fat diet gave you an inflammatory um, phenotype, but the combination of age and a high-fat diet gave you a dramatic increase in all of the markers of um, inflammation that we normally see in, a, um, in patients with NAFL. So, so there's something about age and, um, and, and a, a Western-type diet that, that is synergistic. 
And one of the most dramatic changes is in what we call oxidative stress, or the generation of reactive oxygen species. And the way we like to measure this in our lab is by using this um, lipid um, um, adduct called 4-hydroxynonylil that's not found in a normal liver. But with um, an older liver, on a normal diet, you see it. But then you see it even more dramatically in a, um, an older diet on a high-fat diet. In a high, sorry, an older liver on a high-fat diet. So these um, um, reactive oxygen species are generated one of two ways. One is by enzymatic pathways, and some of the enzymatic pathways, like NADPH oxidase, are induced. But they're also generated by a, a dysfunctional mitochondria. And I think most of the explanation is that, that the mitochondria are not functioning I in, in either aging or, in, um, or with a high-fat diet, and that's what I'm going to show you next. Okay. And, and the final idea about aging and high-fat diet is does it cause more fibrosis? It's fibrosis that's really the evil actor. Most people do not think steatosis alone or maybe some inflammation alone is going to cause problems. It's the fibrosis leading to cirrhosis, leading to hepatocellular cancer. That, that's where we get into trouble. And look how dramatic the synergies are. Th th this is the, um, um, the old mice compared to uh, the young mice. You see some fibrosis, but dramatic is old mice with a high-fat diet. It's way above. It's not additive. It's synergistic, the two, the two different um, phenomena. Okay. Subsequent studies done in other laboratories um, gave even more insight into the mechanism. And what they showed was that macrophage are recruited to the older mouse liver, which I showed in our old study, but that these macrophage, through a mechanism of, of, um, of mediation, decrease the NAD+. Plus. The NAD+, plus, as you probably know, um, is associated with mitochondrial function as well as anti-aging. So if these macrophage inhibit NAD+, plus, you might expect that that in return will lead to damage to the liver. And, and that, that's exactly, exactly um, um, what happens. Okay. And this is a summary from other people's work, but I, I think this this is a good um, way of thinking about um, um, how we get from um, NASH and aging to um, more severe liver disease, and then maybe even to more severe um, effects on human health. So senescent hepatocytes accumulate with age. The senescent hepatocytes are associated with the secretion of, of SASP, which is found in almost every senescent cell. It's called, it stands for senescence-activated um, secreted proteins, and these are mainly inflammatory mediators. Also, senescent hepatocytes are associated with um, a, a defect in, in uh, autophagy, including mitophagy, the removal of aberrant mitochondria. So, so these senescent hepatocytes accumulating with age are a setup for the mitochondria not to work. First of all, you're accumulating dysfunctional mitochondria, and secondly, you are, um, um, the, the, the actual inflammatory mediators themselves interfere with, with the mitochondria. And then the, when the mitochondria dysfunction, as you remember, they're the biggest source of reactive oxygen species. So these reactive species are released into the cell and then in, in, in themselves induce, um, induce senescence. They have this vicious pathway. Senescence, mitochondrial dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, senescence. So, so th this, these are very stimulatory and both of which are um, downstream targets of aging and of, um, and, and, and of NASH. Okay, so this is just a cartoon that summarizes what I said so far, that um, the, um, the healthy hepatocytes are affected by NASH or by aging. These lead to senescence, and these senescence um, can then activate even further downstream um, cells, of which the cell that we study the most is called the hepatic stellate cell, and they in turn lead to the fibrosis. Okay, so what can you do about this? And, and, and <laughs> this is probably already you predicted this from, from previous talks. If you let um, age, age mice ad-lib eat, just like I showed you in our study, another study shows the exact same thing, you get steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis. If you caloric restrict them, they don't, this does not happen. You prevent the, the, this progression of, of this, you know, Nash-like morphology to develop um, in, in the mice. 
And when they did these beautiful um, electron microscopies, you can see in the, a in the age mouse that is having um, ad lib diet, this is not even a Western diet, this is a regular diet, you get the lipid droplets and you get these funny looking uh, mitochondria. But if you caloric restrict, the lipid droplets uh, disappear and the, um, and the mitochondria look great. And this is reflected functionally in that ATP, the major source of ATP is the mitochondria. The ATP levels drop dramatically in the aged mice, but they return to the same levels if you caloric restrict. Okay. Now, this is for Sal. This is how does this have to do with the blue zone? There was a recent review that said many of the components of the Mediterranean diet are actually mitochondrial protective. So if you have a Western diet, uh, sorry, a Mediterranean diet that includes resveratrol, which is found in red wine, um, polyphenols, which is found in olive oil, um, lycopene found in tomatoes. In each one of these, now these studies are not done in humans. These are done in cultured cells looking at mitochondrial function and saying, do the mitochondrial function through all the mechanisms I showed you, you know, reactive oxygen species, all these other things, ATP generation. And in each one of these cases, these specific interventions are able to um, um, are able to stabilize mitochondria in culture, and sometimes these are actually done in, in mice, and there are a few experiments in humans. But that the idea being that maybe one of the functions of the, of the um, Mediterranean diet is to stabilize mitochondria that normally would be damaged by normal aging. Okay, so 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 far we know in NAFL we understand that. Th these lifestyle risks get you in trouble, stationary, obesity, all these things. Um, sleep, you'll like this one, sleep deprivation. Um, in fact, there's some trials using um, 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 CAP for, 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 for NASH. Okay, so, so these get you in trouble. Then the downstream effects of NAFLD are these epigenetic changes, endothelial dysfunction, dyslipidemia, like atherosclerosis, systemic vascular inflammation, um, insulin resistance, all these things. So all these changes that are the result of NAFLD are also very closely associated with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, okay? So, so how is NASH, liver disease, associated with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the most common cause of mortality in the United States? Well, if you look at all patients with NAFL, and this is a meta-analysis, you find that the, the risk of, of um, all cardiovascular events is increased 1.6 percent, 1.6 fold. So 1.6 fold for NAFL causing more cardiovascular events. But if you look at severe NASH, NASH severe NASH we define as inflammation with fibrosis. If you look at severe NASH, then the, um, the risk of cardiovascular events is 2.6 fold increase. This is dramatic increase compared to normal population. So there's an incredibly close association between NASH and cardiovascular disease. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize what I told you, then I'm gonna make an hypothesis of how they're connected. Ready? So I told you so far that um, the incidence of NASH and paracetamol cancer increase with age. Liver functions decrease mildly with age, but I don't think that's clinically relevant. The liver develops steatosis, inflammation, and fibrosis with age, just as it does with NASH. A high fat diet accelerates the aged liver phenotype. This is in mice, it's very dramatic. Caloric restriction decreases the aged liver phenotype and maybe a Mediterranean diet. Um, aging results in mitochondrial dysfunction and senescent hepatocytes. And a low NAD plus to NADPH ratio results in both mitochondrial dysfunction and accelerate hepatocyte senescence. And as I showed you, epidemiologically, NASH is increased, uh, people with NASH have increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So th this is a hypothesis, it, just for fun. So what, what, I think, what I think potentially is going on is that you have aging and obesity. These are both associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and senescent fatty hepatocytes. These two combined, age and obesity, lead to what I'm gonna call an age NASH. In other words, there's something about aging and NASH that are very bad, that they're very synergistic. And the changes that come downstream, the metabolic changes come downstream from NASH can actually be causative in cardiovascular disease. So if that's true, then the answer to the question is a healthy liver will lead to healthy longevity. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Thank you. Hassan.
Thank you, David. Wonderful talk. And um, so, um, do you think there is a possibility that because, as you know, several genetic models of uh, um, animal models of ste liver steatosis, yep. if you uh, uh, um, knock out or enhance and you add uh, atherosclerotic prone that same genetic defect will also cause uh, atherosclerosis. Yeah. That cause. So doesn't that uh, also say that it could be the same disease in two organs? Yeah, because what you are saying yeah. is you first you get your fatty liver and, the, uh, and then you get atherosclerosis, if I understood you correct. No, you understood, you understood exactly correctly, and that's the, hypo that's the alternative hypothesis. So for the sake of discussion, I would like to make it it's actually causative. And I kind of, because I was preparing this talk, I sort of thought about this. I kind of think it's testable, because we have these mouse models of, um, of, of um, NASH that they do get um, heart disease as, as part of the model. So if you can think of some clever way that you can block the NASH without affecting you know, the diet, the, the, the other organs, you could test this. So my proposal would be that blocking the NASH and leaving everything alone, Western diet, everything else alone, will be protective for the heart and kidneys. The alternative is your hypothesis is that they're going simultaneously and that the, 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 the heart disease will progress independent of, of the NASH. And so that's where we are. <laughs> Thank you. Salvatore. I put in the mitochondria for Salvatore. Just yes, so thank you. Otherwise very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Sarif, uh, that you open a new door <laughs> into prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, just one question, because now I'm really fascinated with this mitochondria story and makes a lot of a sense. And, you know, we can also measure some, some way the mitochondria activity. One of the cartoons you show at the beginning was vitamin D also involved into the uh, liver function. Is that do you have any data showing the vitamin D should be, because you know there is a also editorial now in this journal showing that vitamin D is a protective factor for cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Is uh, this NASH impacting the vitamin D productions and then cardiovascular? Yeah, so, so the concept is that vitamin D is protective in certain aspects of NASH. And that was actually not shown by me, by Ron Evans in a paper in Cell a couple years ago, where it involves um, the ability to fibrose. It seems like that's, so, so anything that increases vitamin D or, or reverses, anything that, that inhibits vitamin D will, will, be, will be affected, the NASH phenotype. Thank you. Thank so you, David. And, th and thank you for mentioning senescent uh, cells, because that, I think, is a good uh, uh, slide over to the next speaker. And it's a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. James Kirkland, Mayo Clinic Rochester. And um, uh, you will talk about uh, senolytic drugs for, long for longevity and healthy aging, data from rodents and translations to, to humans. Please. Thanks, I changed the title a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna, um, first of all, just mention the geroscience hypothesis that might have come up before, and that holds that um, fundamental aging processes uh, may be root cause contributors to the bulk of conditions that cause most morbidity, mortality, and health expenditures. And you can split or lump uh, fundamental aging processes, pillars of aging, hallmarks of aging, into anywhere from four to around 15 groups but they're all tightly interconnected in what is being called the unitary theory. So if you target one of these things, you tend to affect all the rest, and you generally affect them in the same direction. Um, so there are a number of things that can influence the rate at which age-related changes occur, and incidentally, aging begins before conception. It's clear now that Down syndrome, for example, is a senescence-driven disorder related to aging the oocyte before it's even fertilized, uh, and everybody's always aging. Uh, but these fundamental aging processes can um, have increased um, uh, operation at etiologic sites in multiple diseases and disorders. So I like to think simply and to lump um, these fundamental processes into four categories, one being cellular senescence, which I'm going to focus on, but I could be talking about any of the other three. Another is inflammation. It tends to be low-grade sterile, that is, in the absence of known bacteria and fungi, and related to chronic uh, inflammation. Uh, I mean, related to um, uh, chronic fibrosis. 
macromolecular dysfunctions, so there's problems with DNA, with proteins, with sugars, for example, um, glycation end products and so forth, lipids, uh, as well as organelle issues like mitochondria, nucleus, um, lysosomes, and then progenitor cell dysfunction, and that can go in either direction. So the activity of some progenitor cells can be increased with increasing age, like osteoclasts, uh, whereas others can be decreased. And um, as I mentioned, um, these fundamental processes appear to be a pinch point that is um, upstream of the geriatric syndromes. I'm a geriatrician, so things like uh, frailty, sarcopenia, falling. You know, in fact, I got tired of prescribing better wheelchairs, walkers, and incontinence devices, and that's why I went back and did a degree in molecular biology. Um, multiple diseases, acute and chronic, throughout the lifespan. Uh, decreased resilience, that is decreased ability to respond to, um, to recover after surgery or respond to a flu shot, decreased remaining survival, aging phenotypes, and decreased uh, reproduction. So I'm going to focus on cellular senescence. As I mentioned, I could be talking about any other processes. Cellular senescence is a cell fate. It's like replication, differentiation, apoptosis, or necrosis. It occurs across the vertebrates and in many invertebrates as well. Um, there are at least 70 things now that can tend to push a cell into the senescent cell fate. Uh, generally, they uh, can involve several categories. One can be repeated replication and oncogene activation because senescent cells can act as a break on cancer development. If you interfere with the capacity of cells to become senescent, you will cause cancer. Um, things like insulin and IGF-1 can drive senescence as well, largely through the replicative uh, form of uh, cellular senescence and other mitogens. Uh, various kinds of um, metabolic stress can induce senescence. Um, for example, proteotoxic stress. Uh, protein aggregates will make cells become senescent. Conversely, senescent cells make protein aggregates. And s senescent cells are where most of the increase in mTOR occurs with increasing age, for example, and decreased um, autophagy. Um, hyperoxia or hypoxia can both cause senescence. Uh, it looks like um, Neonatal hyperoxia to recover babies um, at, that have been stressed at birth appears to be an upstream cause of asthma in two to four year olds with senescent cells developing in the lungs, for example. Mechanical stress by def deforming the nuclear envelope um, uh, and affecting laminae can cause senescence. This appears to be the basis for senescence in osteoarthritis or at bifurcations of blood vessels. Uh, inflammation. Um, itself can induce senescence and damage associated molecular patterns. So uh, extracellular DNA, for example, can drive cells into senescence. And pathogens can induce senescence. Um, Gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, fungi, uh, RNA and DNA viruses. Uh, coronavirus, for example, is a potent inducer of cellular senescence through TLR3 and the C-gas sting pathway. Senescence, unlike other cell fates, takes a long time to develop um, fully, from a week to six weeks, and this is important when it comes to um, intervention. So apoptosis only takes 18 hours. Senescence takes a week to six weeks to become fully established. There are no good markers of senescence that everybody would agree on, and there are shades of gray. So there are pre-senescent cells. Not every senescent cell is an increase in P16. Not every senescent cell is an increase in P21. Some don't have increases in either. So there are at least five transcription factor cascades that can enforce senescence. Most senescent cells, as we heard before, develop this senescence-associated secretory phenotype, and uh, it's highly variable, and it depends on the kind of cell that became senescent, how long it's been senescent, the inducer, and the microenvironment. And some of the factors in the SAS can vary by over a thousandfold, depending on the microenvironment. For example, coronavirus makes the SASP of senescent cells a, a thousand times more pro-inflammatory and some of the pathways for that have been worked out. The SAS can entail not only production of proteins, um, things like uh, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, uh, profibrotic factors, but also a range of bioactive molecules, various prostanoids, um, ceramides, and so forth, and a huge range of non-coding nucleotides, especially uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA can be um, produced by senescent cells, not only in exosomes, but also through argonaut, cell-free, and that signals to other cells. Uh, various microRNAs are produced, circular RNAs and circular DNAs that are resistant to degradation, much like cancer cells. 
in around 30% of senescent cells, the secretary state is pro-inflammatory, pro-apoptotic, and tissue damaging. The other 30 to 70%, it is pro-growth, and it can switch. Senescent cells are resistant to dying, and this is through what we call SCAPs, or senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. So they're normally only cleared by the innate immune system. 80% uh, of senescent cells were removed by natural killer cells. Uh, there are elements of the adaptive immune system that can clear them as well, especially on the T lymphocyte side, but they, are, they do not die on their own. They have to be removed. So if you transplant very small numbers of senescent cells into mice, these are autologous. You can take an ear fibroblast, um, ear fibroblasts and radiate them or not and transplant them back into the same mouse after putting constructs in so you can identify the transplanted cells. If you transplant them intraperitoneally, they tend to stay there. Um, after, if you, there's a threshold phenomenon, so if you transplant a million senescent cells into a middle-aged mouse, after a couple of months, the mouse will develop frailty and early death. Uh, if you transplant 500,000 senescent cells, though, nothing happens. If you transplant, though, 500,000 senescent cells into an old mouse or a high-fat-fed mouse instead of a middle-aged mouse that's lean, you will cause this frailty syndrome and early death to occur. Now, this means that only one in 10,000 cells in that transplanted mouse is a senescent cell. That is sufficient to do this. Um, the causes of death after transplanting senescent cells are the same as in aged mice. So you accelerate every known cause of death in mice. Furthermore, senescence spreads both in an, uh, a paracrine and an endocrine manner. So the senescent cells stay put in the peritoneum, but you find uh, senescent cells start appearing in the brain and the limbs. And this is largely related to non-coding nucleotides that um, result in spread of senescence, but also certain proteins. So this is probably the reason for the threshold phenomenon, at least in our view. Um, there comes a point where the rate of spread of senescence exceeds the ability of the immune system to clear these cells, and then there's a takeoff. And then they start poisoning the immune system. So senescent cells produce factors that inhibit macrophage function. They uh, greatly interfere with, with, with uh, dendritic cells, especially mitochondrial DNA, and this is the basis for uh, graft-versus-host disease and accelerated rejection of organs from older donors. Uh, and they produce factors that affect especially CD8 T lymphocyte function, and this is partly the basis of uh, the acceleration that can occur of cancers uh, because of senescent cells. So senescence is a defense against cancer, but it can also accelerate cancer development. Senescence is also important for many functions. For example, they accumulate, senescent cells accumulate in the placenta. They produce the, babies, they produce the factors that drive the baby through the birth canal. They're important in tissue remodeling, so they have beneficial and detrimental functions, but it's persistent senescent cells that become pro-inflammatory over time, start developing line one elements and multiple mutations that seem to cause damage if they're not removed. Uh, if they revert from being senescent into a non-senescent cell, they do so as cancers. And now there's a belief that many cancers go through a stage of senescence before they escape senescence and emerge as a cancer cell. So Ned Sharpless published an important paper in JCI in 2004. He showed that caloric restriction reduced um, uh, senescent cell burden in older animals, and this was correlated with improvements in health span. Uh, so there was an association shown. And so that led us, our, our group, when we were in Boston before moving to Mayo, to begin to try to figure out, is this an association or is there a causal link? We started trying to develop um, ways of killing senescent cells pharmacologically. Uh, we first started trying to make fusion proteins where we would have um, one end of the protein bind to a senescent cell and carry a toxic cargo, got nowhere with it. Smarter people than us have since been able to do that. We tried high-throughput screens, working with scripts, didn't get anywhere. And then finally it hit us, and it only took us a month to develop Senalytics when this idea hit us in May 2013. But senescent cells, those, that 30 to 70% that are tissue damaging, are surviving despite the fact they're killing cells around them. We asked, why is that the case? Why don't they die? This made us think of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and B lymphomas where there's activation of pathways that are anti-apoptotic that defend these cells against committing suicide, basically. We used early bioinformatics approaches from mass spec proteomic data uh, and found that um, 
there's a network of these SCAT pathways, senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. We found originally five pathways. Now there are a total of 10 that are known. They interact. They're different in every kind of senescent cell and with different inducers. We used RNA interference approaches to interrogate this network, and we found that for certain kinds of human senescent cells, human preautocytes, or some people call them MSCs or whatever, uh, that were made uh, senescent by radiation or not, versus human endothelial cells made senescent by radiation or not, uh, we could get rid of the 30 to 70% of cells that were senescent with different, by hitting different SCAP nodes. So different kinds of senescent cells depend on different pathways to survive. In the case of mesenchymal cells, this is mainly due to, related to dependence receptors, especially the efferin kinases. Um, and uh, in the case of endothelial cells, this is mainly related to BCL2 family members, especially BCL extra large, uh, but also uh, certain heat shock protein related pathways. And then both can be impacted by serpene related um, uh, pro survival pathways and others. So then we went to programs available through the Broad Institute again back in May 2013. And we asked, are there molecules that would target uh, key nodes on this SCAP network, small molecules that we could uh, develop into drugs? We um, came up with a list of 40 agents. Uh, they all turned out to be senolytic. Uh, we focused early on on agents that had a track record of being safe and effective and orally active in humans and have a short elimination half-life. We predicted dasatinib, which is different from other tyrosine kinase inhibitors in that it targets the SARC uh, efferin dependent kinase. Um, other uh, tyrosine kinases like imatinib are not senolytic, but we figured it might be senolytic, and we found indeed it killed the 30 to 70 percent of senescent HUVEX that are um, pro inflammatory, I mean, uh, and uh, preautocytes, we pre and it didn't kill the HUVEX as we would have predicted. We looked at certain flavonols, um, predicting that they would kill senescent human endothelial cells. Uh, Kersetin was one of the ones that we looked at. Fazetin is another one. Kersetin is what makes apple peels taste bitter. It kills the 30 to 70 percent of um, uh, senescent um, HUVEX, but didn't kill uh, senescent preautocytes or MSCs, as we predicted. The combination killed both. And we found that there were some senescent cell types that were killed by neither agent alone but would be killed by the combination because these pathways can be redundant. And there are many other kinds of senescent cells that are not killed by that combination either. So different kinds of senescent cells, you need different senolytics. Using that original mechanism-based approach, now there are some uh, 40 or so senolytics that were discovered and now high throughput library screens have been developed and other approaches, CAR-T approaches, vaccines, et cetera. And there are at least a couple of hundred senolytics available. The worry about vaccines is it's hard to turn them off, and what would happen if a woman wanted to become pregnant, for example? This, this could be a major issue. If you give a blast of radiation to uh, the leg of a mouse, its hair goes gray after a couple of uh, months, and it starts having trouble running on a treadmill. If you give a single dose orally of dasatinib and carcetin to that mouse, it's able to run on a treadmill the same way throughout as a sham radiated animals throughout the remainder of its life because there's no impetus for new senescent cells to form. Senescent cells generally don't divide, so once they're gone, they're gone. Uh, and you don't have to treat repeatedly if there's no impetus for new senescent cells to form. This means that we can use a hit and run approach with senolytics. It takes a week to six weeks for new senescent cells to form. We purposely look for drugs that have very short elimination half-lives. And that's because we know that it just takes two hours exposure of a senescent cell to a senolytic uh, for irreversible apoptosis to start. So we've, we and many other groups have found that there are some 70 conditions in uh, preclinical models that look like they can be treated with senolytics. And the same could be true with um, sirtuin agonists like resveratrol, with NAD precursors, with all of these other agents. Uh, I show here 48 of them. Uh, that have been shown in most studies. So one of the things that we've set up is something called the Translational Geroscience Network. They're crazy enough to make me PI of it for now, but it, it includes the institutions listed and another six are joining. It's funded by the National Institutes of Health. And um, through that network, we have um, 41 clinical trials underway. Uh, about half the trials are with, um, uh, a, a third of the trials are with senolytics. Uh, the others are with other agents uh, like metformin, which inhibits the SASP. That's how it works. 
uh, through uh, targeting complex foreign mitochondria. It inhibits both the protein and the non-coding nucleotide part of the SASP. Resveratrol is another SASP inhibitor, senamorphic, they're sometimes called. It only targets the protein portion of the SASP. And the same with the JAK inhibitors like uh, ruxolitinib. So we have trials underway of these various agents, and in some cases, comparing different agents. Now, the kinds of trials are for, uh, that are currently underway are for a whole range of conditions, because as I mentioned, these fundamental aging processes uh, occur across the lifespan. So there are a couple of trials underway for frailty in women with gait speeds of less than 0.6 meters per second, which carries a 50% two-year uh, mortality. Uh, there are three trials underway for Alzheimer's disease, one for mild cognitive impairment. There are trials underway for osteo osteoporosis, four trials funded by the Navy in the US for osteoarthritis because of too much resistance exercise in Marines and sailors, um, which causes osteoarthritis. And we also find that there's spread of senescence from the knee joint to the brain. When we look at the abundance of senescent cells in the removed knee and CSF, because these people are having spinal anesthesia. So senescence spreads, it's a systemic problem. Uh, there are trials underway for uh, diabetes and obesity, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'll show you preliminary results. There are three trials for COVID underway. Uh, there are trials underway for trying to rehabilitate organs from older donors so they can be transplanted into younger recipients. Uh, cancer survivors, including one in childhood cancer survivors that's being done with St. Jude, comparing diff two different senolytic regimens funded by the National Cancer Institute compared to placebo. There is a trial about to begin in one two punch approach for glioblastoma multi, uh, to try to prevent um, uh, recurrence of the disease, and we're uh, planning trials for triple negative breast cancer in a one two punch approach. Uh, we're looking at space travel and have found that senescence increases after space travel, partly related to zero gravity and um, space radiation. Uh, an early trial, it's phase zero with all the problems that these trials have. Um, no placebo group, a lot of, you know, ways that there could be, you know, especially if you're looking at something like frailty where uh, there are all kinds of biases that could be introduced. But in this very preliminary trial, it looked like a few doses of senolytics in people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a senescence-driven disease. And most patients actually die from frailty-related things with it, not shortness of breath. Um, we found improvements in six-minute walk, four-meter gait, um, chair stands, and short physical performance battery, and that's leading to a phase 2A trial. We found that there's target engagement in humans, so we did fat biopsies at day 0 and day 14, gave uh, the senolytics disatinib and carcetin orally at days 0, 1, and 2. Disatinib is a three-hour elimination half-life, carcetin an 11-hour elimination half-life, so they're both completely gone within 33 hours. 11 days after the last dose, we found there were decreased markers of senescence in these obese, younger, diabetic um, individuals with incipient renal dysfunction. Uh, we also found, I don't, I don't show it here, decreased markers of um, fibrosis in their adipose tissue and decreased uh, macrophage infiltration. We're trying across all these trials to measure the same things in blood, urine, um, um, saliva, buccal swabs, nail clippings, hair clippings, microbiome, et cetera, uh, through the facility for geroscience analysis, which is part of the Translational Geroscience Network. So the FDA requires that we meet nine criteria uh, to have a CLIA-certified uh, gerodiagnostic panel. Uh, we're looking at composite scores, and we're not interested in straight biological clocks. We're more interested in things that uh, predict which intervention to use whether there's a response to the intervention. Does it change in the right direction with the intervention? And it looks like composite scores may be better than individual um, uh, uh, values. An early composite score in one of the clinical trials, uh, this one just looking at senescence markers in the translational jar of science network, we're looking at all of the pillars of aging, but um, it showed that with blood biomarkers, we can uh, detect some improvement, which helps, uh, you know, eventually we want to get to this, these kinds of things as endpoints for uh, clinical trials. We also found that, uh, as I mentioned, these fundamental aging processes are interlinked. We heard before about the link between NAD and um, senescence. Um, there are similar links with inflammation, with fibrosis, and with gyroprotective factors. So Clotho, named after the Greek, fake goddess who holds up the spool of life, 
Um, if it's overexpressed in mice, it causes the greatest increase in health span of any known intervention, I believe, in, in mice. It's a huge molecule, five exons. Uh, it's very difficult to administer. It goes down with age in both humans and mice. And if it's, as I mentioned, if it's overexpressed in mice, um, it results in increases in health span. It's mainly produced in the brain, the kidneys, and fat tissue. We found in 20 out of 20 people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that if we gave senolytics, we had an increase in urine alpha clotho. So it's going to be important to have, to look at geroprotective factors, and there are many more of them, so that we can devise ratios of, di of detrimental things to protective things, because we can't be using in urine, for example, creatinine as a numerator, you know, because that's going to bias our results. So we want to look at ratios of gerodetrimental factors to gero uh, protective factors. So in conclusion, persistent senescent cells appear to cause inflammation, fibrosis, progenitor cell dysfunction, spread of senescence, and multiple disease and age-related disorders. The target of senolytics is, not senes is senescent cells, not a single molecular pathway. We work with the branch of the FDA that deals with antibiotics. They're not interested in one drug, one target, one disease. We're not dealing with hypertension. We're after a combination of drugs. We don't care what they are. We might use five, six, ten drugs and lifestyle interventions. We're targeting senescent cells, and we're going after every disease in the book the same way that you would if you're developing antibiotics, where you may use three, four, or five antibiotics. You're going, and you're going after urinary tract infections, uh, meningitis, skin infections. Similar approach, and the FDA fortunately f views it that way. Um, senolytics appear to attenuate tissue inflammation and fibrosis, improve function, reduce rejection after transplanting organs from old individuals. I didn't have time to go through that. And they target therapy-induced senescent cells that are caused by cancer treatments uh, and are cancer harboring. A hit-and-run intermittent approach is as, if not more, effective than giving the drugs continuously. So we purposely look for drugs with very short elimination half-lives so that we can reduce off-target effects. Um, and they appear to delay or prevent multiple diseases, improve um, tissue regeneration. They actually improve uh, results after transplanting um, uh, progenitor cells, and they enhance health span in mice. But that doesn't mean they'll work in people. Anything that sounds too good to be true is. Um, phase 2A trials have a 5 to 30 percent chance of working. Um, you know, I've come from a 0.0001 percent chance of believing these drugs might work to maybe a 20% chance now, but there's an 80% chance they won't. And the reason we're doing multiple trials of different senolytics, but also looking at senomorphics and things like uh, NAD precursors, uh, and we're trying to do them in parallel rather than series, is we're hoping something will hit. I think it's very dangerous for the public to be taking these agents and buying them over the counter or physicians to prescribe them at this point. The only place for them is in carefully controlled um, clinical trials, and we're going to fail in most of the trials, and the public has to be aware of that and not give up when we do fail, because we will fail in most of them. I'm touching wood, I hope. Uh, there's wood here. We haven't had any serious adverse events so far, but it doesn't mean they won't happen, and I lie awake every night worried about it. So I'll conclude by thanking a lot of people who helped us out uh, with this work. I think there are quite a few people in the room who've been involved in this. There are trials, incidentally, beginning in Sweden. Ulf Smith has trials beginning in Gothenburg. There's a trial beginning at the Karolinska of some of these agents. There are a couple of trials in Copenhagen uh, talking about, you know, um, Scandinavia. There are, there are several trials beginning in Holland. Uh, and um, uh, Japan is thinking of setting up a network, something like the Translational Geroscience Network. So there are eight universities in Japan beginning to speak to each other about this. Thanks. Sorry, it went over. But. Uh, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I, want, I mean, on the, and the uh, IPF uh, results, uh, early results were still there, really, and they make sense uh, in in terms of the the mechanism here. But they're phase one. Yeah, I understand that. But my question is, do you have any uh, uh, since this? The idea, if I understand you right, is that the, the, um, it's a process involved in biolo general biological aging, not a disease-specific. That's why you aim for a lot of different diseases. So do you have some data from, from animals or so that you can, for example, see if, 
um, let's say, a diabetes model where animals who would get treatment uh, would be protected from diabetic complications without affecting uh, glycemia in any, in any way. Uh, yes, so and so we've shown that for, um, we were talking before about hepatic steatosis, we've shown it with brain dysfunction actually, so obesity is associated with anxiety and depression. Uh, it turns out that senescence spreads to the cells lining the third ventricle. This was uh, published in uh, cell metabolism a couple of years ago. Uh, they produce factors that cause uh, um, um, failed neurodegeneration, gliosis, and failed neurovascular supply in the region between the third ventricle and the limbic system, and they result in mice becoming anxious. And you can measure anxiety in mice because they get afraid of open spaces. They're afraid of birds. That's why you lay mouse traps around the wall. But Obese mice are even more afraid. Um, if you treat them with senolytics, they lose that anxiety and they get restored neurogenesis in the region between the third ventricle and the um, limbic system. We're uh, beginning now clinical trials for chronic diabetic skin ulcers. So this is the one place where topical senolytics look like they may be uh, beneficial. Uh, there are three trials underway. Well, there are trials underway now for macular degeneration. There was a company that had um, uh, um, a trial that sort of met its endpoint, injecting Navitoclax into the eye for wet macular degeneration. I'm not sure that's the best way to go. There's a trial beginning now that's been funded by a benefactor for looking with oral senolytics at uh, dry macular degeneration. Uh, and then there, uh, there are trials beginning for diabetic nephropathy. And, and let's see if there are anyone else. Yes, David. You have to excuse my lack of knowledge, but that was a fantastic talk. Um, so I can understand where, where, where you know, the, senile, the senescent cells can have an effect locally, like a paracrine effect, because you know, the root secreting all these things. But, but, but how do you explain the, the more distal effects on, on you know, far away, the senescent cells will affect senescence in, in, in distant part of the body? Well, we did, we work with Stefan Tullius. He's chief of transplant surgery at the Brigham, close friend. Uh, and he transplanted hearts from old mice to young mice, young mice to young mice, old mice to old mice. Right. <laughs> and um, um, what we found is that, um, as in the cell transplantation experiments, uh, um, the um, recipient's own cells at a great distance started becoming senescent if, a, if an old heart were transplanted. It turns out it's mitochondrial DNA, okay, that's which a, that's is a major that's driver of this and various isoforms of it. And it also drives chronic graft versus host disease. So there's an intent to start trials for graft versus host disease. And there are two sites beginning this. Um, we're looking at kidneys um, in Boston. Uh, but these are, we're throwing away at the moment 35,000 kidneys a year in the US because they're from uh, people who've died in car crashes who are over age 50. We're planning trials for islet transplantation. Um, both islets and pancreatic transplantation because they're not used if the donors are over age 45. And there's a trial in Holland looking at uh, partial uh, liver transplantation. Uh, One more question, please. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, just generally, uh, I'm curious about the distinction between good and bad senescence, and particularly, let's say, senolytics in pregnant mice. How bad would be that for development? And, and if Senolytics can distinguish actually the good senescent cells. And that's the well, senescent cell, uh, senolytics will only by definition kill those senescent cells that are producing uh, pro apoptotic factors because they allow the cells to commit suicide. So they do not kill senescent cells that are producing growth factors, for example, like PDGFAA that are needed for wound healing. Um, we have to extend, though, the range of c kinds of senescent cells that can be killed in the case of cancer because. If chemotherapy and radiation don't outright kill cancer cells, um, they can drive them into a state of senescence and they can escape that senescence and come back as tumor, as, as therapy resistant, radiation and chemotherapy resistant cancer cells that spread quickly. So one of the things we're trying to do is develop agents that'll kill the non pro um, uh, senescent cells as well. And there's some early um, indication that that may be the case. There's what they call dormant tumor cells and senescent cells. Um, it's sort of a gray area. Senescent cells are arrested at, um, you know, 
G1S transition tumor cells at G0 if there are dormant tumor cells, but they can go through this, they can transit back and forth. So there's a recent Cold Spring Harbor conference on this with you know, people from Sloan Kettering, St. Jude, uh, MD Anderson, et cetera, looking at the relation of senescence to um, cancers and whether there should be a one-two punch approach, chemotherapy, radiation, then senolytics, and chemotherapy, radiation, then senolytics. The NCI has espoused that. They've published two position papers on it, and they've got calls for proposals. Thank you so much. Thanks.